Michał Strawiński. Sergiej Prokofiew. Paul Hindemith. Dmitry Shostakovich. Benjamin Britten. Familiar names for music lovers around the world. Harald Severud. Think about this. The Norwegian composer Harald Severud was born 16 years after Bela Bartok and 16 years before Benjamin Britten. Incidentally, also exactly two weeks after the death of Brahms. Well, it is now uh, 20 years after the death of Severud in 1992 and he is still far from a household name among the music public. This in spite of the high quality of the output that he left us, which includes many orchestral compositions, a lot of music for solo piano, music for a diversity of ensembles and for solo instruments with or without accompaniment. This lack of familiarity with Severud's work continues to baffle me, and this is the reason why I have decided to make this video. My first encounter with the music of Harald Severud uh, happened in 1985 or 86, while I was a student at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. My fellow student, the Norwegian pianist Einar Röttingen, performed a few of Severud's pieces for solo piano at a concert. The music seemed to me both familiar and new. It was as if music was speaking through this composer, but in an entirely new dialect. A dialect that was very attractive to me. 
Einar Röttingen often mentioned the name Harald Severud to me. In my mind, this name conjured up an image of some kind of magic man or ancient druid from the deep forest. I finally met Harald Severud on July 27th, 1986. Einar Röttingen introduced him to me and we spent a whole evening at his home, Siljustöl, that wonderful mansion outside of Bergen, where Severud lived between 1939 and the year he died, 1992. I was immediately struck by Severud's powerful presence and by the time I heard him sing the opening bars of his famous piano piece Schempevise Slotten or Ballad of Revolt he had completely captivated me. It seemed as though the sounds that were emanating from the lungs of that 89-year-old man were being dug from the bowels of the earth. I knew there and then that I had met a truly great composer. This is not the place to discuss Harald Severud's vast musical output. I do, however, wish to say a few words about the string quartets. Severud developed an interest in writing chamber music quite late in life. Uh, he was 73 when he composed his first string quartet and uh, well over 81 by the time he completed the third one. He also wrote two woodwind quintets later on. The three string quartets form a very interesting collection. Aside from their individual merits, they're very different from one another. The first one is the shortest and it plays uninterrupted in one movement. It's called Serenades of the Two Rivals. And the two rivals are represented by the viola and cello who are asked to sit in front of the ensemble with the two violins sitting behind. There is a small story attached to the piece. Um, we have a love-struck gentleman who late at night stands under the window of his beloved in order to serenade her. It's all very nice and very well, but a few moments later another man shows up wanting to serenade the same lady. As one might expect, uh, a conflict arises. Well, there's much arguing and toing and froing and so on, but after a while it is decided that both will get to sing his serenade. So this takes place, but judging from the final fight between the cello and the viola, it's clear that no positive outcome comes out of it. So we're left with the night music having the last word, leaving an open ending for the piece. The second string quartet is the longest of the three. A very ambitious composition, almost what could say uh, of symphonic proportions. It is cast into large parts, each of which is divided into movements played without interruption. It is a truly magnificent composition um, and is also cast in a sort of arch form with material from the first movement being recapitulated in the last movement. It's a really wonderful quartet, the least performed of several quartets, unfortunately. And this leads us to the third quartet, which is the main subject of this video. It is, one could say, the most classical of the three, without meaning by any stretch of the imagination that it is easy listening or anything like that. It's far from that. It's very demanding music. It is written in three movements, uh, to which Severud originally gave titles. 
The first one was called Searching, the second Pastoral Repose, and the third and last, the last word. The first movement is dominated by the viola, which has a very prominent part. The second movement, uh, in my opinion, Severud might as well have called it pastoral repose in Western Norway. Anyone familiar with the climate of uh, Western Norway, and Bergen in particular, will know that the weather can change at the drop of a hat. A beautiful sunny day can suddenly turn into a rainstorm. This capriciousness of the weather is certainly very much present in the second movement of this quartet. And as we shall see, the final movement is a very lively Passacaglia. These three string quartets by Severud are, in my opinion, right up there with the quartets of Bartok or Shostakovich, to name two 20th century composers who wrote many string quartets. Of course, they're nothing like Shostakovich or Bartok. They are very much music by mature Harald Severud. And as with much of his music, they still are awaiting the recognition they richly deserve. The movement opens with five notes played by the viola. An ascending minor second, a descending minor second, and a lift of a major third, immediately answered by three piccicato notes on the cello, to which the viola replies with yet five more notes. This small dialogue sets the mood for the rest of the introduction, during which the first proper theme is hinted at several times. It finally appears in full bloom, played by the first violin. Here is how it sounds played by the whole quartet. Severud had earlier used this theme on his orchestral work Sonata Giubilata. Without more ado, the next important musical idea is presented by the first violin, played Piccicato. It is a row of 21 eighth notes. This sets in motion a process of continuous variation, very characteristic for Severud. See, for example, how the cello makes a rhythmic variant of this 21-note idea with interjections from the second violin. Followed by a frankly awkward bowing for the cello, again based on the same idea. Severud was fond of stretching the players beyond their comfort zone in order to create tension and excitement in the music. In a short respite from this relentless musical torrent, we see a good example of Severud's masterful writing for the full ensemble. On first look, it may appear that the entire group is playing on this passage. However, 
look closely and you will see that there is as much silence in the parts as there is sound, except for the viola which plays continuously. The second violin and cello share an idea while the first violin reinforces the second beat of the bar with a piccicato note. Eventually the first theme and the 21 note motif end up playing simultaneously and as if by magic a new idea emerges. It is again hinted at several times before it appears in its full form. This jolly little theme in 5-8 was a favorite of Severitz. Originally number 11 in his 20 duets for two violins, it reappeared on the Minnesota Symphony and on the second woodwind quintet. It is no coincidence that the theme is in five. Remember the five notes with which the viola opened the movement? That opening minor second interval is also significant. It carries on to the concluding rather bizarre viola solo based precisely on the repeated falling minor second B flat A. This interval is the last thing heard in the movement, played twice almost sheepishly by the viola against a held long B natural from the rest of the quartet. The second movement seems to grow out of the ending of the first one. The minor second interval that concluded the first movement is now played in contrary motion by the first violin and viola. A new five note motif appears on the second violin, answered by five more notes in the cello, both played piccicato. Number five continues to be central to the work. Soon a long singing theme dominated by a Siciliano rhythm is presented by the first violin. This leads to a new idea, a small arabesque played, again, by the first violin. Notice the peculiar notation. Severud wanted the third note of the triplet to have a special resonance. For this purpose he invented that funny squiggly accent. Most of the movement is built on the interaction between these elements. The cello gets to play the violin theme in its entirety before a transition leads to the appearance of a new theme. This is none other than the melody of the viola serenade from Severud's first string quartet, serenades of the two rivals, but in a different key. 
This new theme steers the music towards unrest and turmoil. Eventually, the long violin theme reappears, this time played pianissimo and in canon with the viola. A new build-up brings the music to an even higher peak of intensity before finally the music sinks into the pastoral restfulness promised by the original title. A typically outlandish introduction ushers in the third movement, a passacaglia based on a theme of, not surprisingly at this stage, five measures presented by the viola. The principle of continuous variation was an ideal stimulant to Severud's fertile imagination. Let's take a look at a few of the ways in which this five-bar theme is transformed and varied in the course of the movement. Here the cello repeats every other note with accented sixteenth notes, of which the viola reinforces not the first, as one might expect, but the second one. And here the cello, again, plays the notes of the theme in the right order, but with octave displacements. The music even gives rise to secondary small themes, such as this one on the first violin. or this dialogue between the violins. In the middle of the movement, the pace slows down and the inversion of the theme is introduced, here demonstrated by the second violin. It is interesting to note that the first part of this movement was originally intended as a piano piece to be included in the fifth book of Tunes and Dances from Silvestrel, which never materialized. It would have occupied the opus number 26, which, as we know, does not exist in Severud's work list. This brings us to the end of the quartet, an ending which poses a conundrum. The handwritten manuscript shows that Severud wrote two endings for the quartet, one of which he discarded. Here is the discarded ending. The final chord is unequivocally a sixth chord. B minor in first inversion with the root, B natural, on the viola. Now let's take a look at the final chord in the version that Severud approved. As we see, the notes of the chord are placed exactly on the same place in the staves as in the discarded ending. But on closer look, we can clearly see that there is a piece of manuscript paper pasted on top of another. 
Now, did Severus simply forget to make the clef change in the viola from G clef to alto clef? Without the clef change, we are left with a peculiar sounding D major chord with the fifth on the top played by the viola. The change to alto clef on the viola would give the same B minor chord in first inversion as the final chord of the discarded version. So, which is right? Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to discuss this with the composer. However, I am inclined to espouse the theory that Severed simply made the human mistake of forgetting to append that alto clef in that piece of paper that he pasted at the end of the page. The sixth chord has such a characteristic sound that it is hard for me to imagine that Severud would want to change it to a D major on a whim. The two available recordings of this quartet, on one of which I was involved as the first violinist, both play the last chord as a D major with the viola fifth on top. So, the performance you're about to hear and watch is possibly the first time that the piece has ever been performed with a B minor in first inversion as the final chord. Well, these were only a few comments to hopefully help you enter into the world of Severed's third string quartet. I certainly did not wish to give a detailed description of the piece. It would take much too long and it would be frightfully tedious. Uh, descriptions of good music are inevitably never nearly as good as the music itself. And the listener has certainly the right to experience the joy and thrill of getting to know, discovering a music by himself or herself. So you're about to watch now a performance of Severus third string quartet. I am very happy to have made this video with three very talented young players. This is my belief and my hope that the future of music always lies in the hands of the next generation. And I certainly hope that these young players and many others who may be exposed to this music will have a wish to to take it out into the world
And that was Harald Severud's third string quartet. And so we have come to the end of this video, a video which you will have noticed has been made with very modest means. Mind you, I would have been just as happy to have made the film with a professional camera crew, but my feeling was that this film needed to be made and I was not prepared to sit around any longer and wait for um, some external interest in the form of perhaps financial support or something like that. As I said in the beginning of the film, it is already 20 years since the death of Harald Severud in 1992 and I still don't see his music being programmed to any large extent particularly by symphony orchestras and even more particularly by Norwegian symphony orchestras which I would imagine have their responsibility to present the best of Norwegian symphonic music to the world especially when they go out on tour. It is my sincere hope that watching this video may have uh, motivated you, tickled your curiosity, perhaps even inspired you to further look into the music of this wonderful composer, Harald Severud. At any rate, thank you very much for your attention and goodbye.